Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today is the 1st of August. We have really important updates beginning with Krasnohorovka, then going to the Pokrovsk direction and finishing off with New York and Toretsk. Let's zoom in and see where the Russians advanced and you could see the new gains from the past 24 hours or since the last video in yellow over here. Some of these, for instance, the gains that occurred in northern Krasnohorovka, I will begin to change into the same color as all of the other sort of Russian gains in Donetsk, but I'm going to leave an outline and write the dates at which the Russians were able to capture them. And so you have a way of basically forming a timeline of the gains themselves. But for now, let's look in yellow because the Russian forces were able to advance south of Krasnohorovka. The extent of the gain is about one kilometer westwards, and the Russians are now only about, let's see, about 700 meters away from taking over this vertical road that connects northern Marinka to the southwestern corner of Krasnohorovka. The Ukrainians are not really using this road, but what they are doing is continuing to send in small squads south of this pond facility over here. You have a lot of ponds that are connected together here, and it forms a natural barrier. And you have some Ukrainians that are taking advantage of the tree line over here from the 46th Air Assault Brigade to try to hold up the Russian node that is located in Hirohivka or Marinka to prevent them from forming a very strong flank located north of those populated villages that would essentially undermine Ukraine's continued presence within the rail line area, which I'm marking with an X over here. Because although the Ukrainians have largely been pushed out of southwestern Krasnohorovka, which you can see is largely uh, either under Russian control or currently a gray zone. There is still a limited Ukrainian presence within trenches and just foliage that is located in the windbreaks of this tree line. And there's also a path going through it. And so you do have this sort of constant movement of troops to the front line over here to try to hold a sort of cohesive position and prevent the Russians from just taking advantage of these vast swaths of open fields that could open a route to Hostra, for instance, that would also give the Russians a really important northern flank on Maximilianivka, where there's fighting right now, and also help the Russians get closer to the Vavcha River itself, which you see located further north. And also, if we're looking several kilometers westwards, also to the key defense node of Krakove. I've talked about this in detail in previous videos, but just to look at the current situation, the Russian forces have been able to clear out some of the remaining houses where there were previously Ukrainian troops operating and those air assault forces, they were targeted extensively by Russian shelling. Now the Russians have actually went in and cleared it out following their success in clearing out the entirety of the Krasnohorovka town that is south of the Lozova River. Now in terms of populated regions that remain under Ukrainian control, as we've said before, it's mainly 117th Brigade, 80th Air Assault Brigade, 9th Motorized Battalion, operating within some of these dachas just north of Krasnokorovka proper. And after that, again, it really is just vast swaths of open fields. It's If we're measuring it out, it's about 7 kilometers before you reach, you reach Krakivka. And it really is, if we're measuring out from Novelske, for instance, about 10 kilometers before you reach the next populated areas that are just on the river valley. Now moving on to the Pokrovsk direction, you could see that Pokrovsk is getting closer and closer to what I'm going to call the Overton window of the front line. Because if you look at it, the Russians are now just measuring it. No villages in between them in Vesele right now and Hrodivka. So it's just open fields and maybe some defenses in this four kilometer strip, including a paved road to reach Hrodivka. And then from that point on, the Russians are only about 13 kilometers away from Mirnohrad and 17 kilometers away from Pokrovsk. And so, you know, some of the shorter range mortars and howitzers are not directly targeting these Ukrainian hubs yet. But now that you have the Russians solidifying control over the eastern bank of the Vavcha River, there's definitely going to be a movement of Russian artillery pieces even further west than Ocheratina, which has already become an artillery node. We know this because some Ukrainian drone units have actually struck Russian howitzers that are concealed near the rail line over here. They could theoretically be moved several kilometers westwards to some of the hills over here. And given the fact that the Russians are continuing to advance westwards, this position in X would already have some sort of, you know, buffer to it. 
And so even in the region around Yevanivka, Voskot, there could be a movement now of the Black Hussars because that's sort of the artillery element of the 15th Brigade that's very active around here. And that could begin to have an effect on really important logistical loads and villages on the front line are already getting impacted like Hordivka. And Hordivka is more than just a settlement on the line of contact. It actually does give the Russians specific access to a road that leads to Mirnohrad from the south. If you're measuring it out, only about nine kilometers around that specific route. But to zoom in and see where the Russians are advancing, they were able to get control over this polygon amounting to about two square kilometers. And it is in a region just south of Volvce. We don't know which units are directly pushing through each individual field, but we do know for sure that the 15th Brigade is operating around Volvce and certain elements of the 27th Motor Rifle Division, which is one of the main Russian um, larger formations that is actually present right now and is conducting frontline operations. And they have three regiments, motor rifle regiments, that are fighting over here. 433rd is one of the most notable of them. And we don't know exactly which village they're in, but they have definitely by now actually crossed over the river and are helping exploit the rail line node, for instance. So the Russians have been able to advance really close to one of the last Ukrainian strongholds protecting the northeastern flank of Jelana. The Russians advanced about 1.1 kilometers in that sort of southwestern direction, and now the fortifications are turning into a gray zone. The Russians are also very close to reaching a lot of these defenses that were built up to protect the eastern approaches of the west bank of the Vavcha River Valley. You could see how all these defenses in yellow were built as specific nodes that could help seal off any sort of Russian crossing uh, past the river through roads or bridges or whatever it may be towards the village. And now a lot of that is going to be rendered superfluous because the entire idea was to defend horizontally, but now they're actually going to get flanked vertically by the Russians and it's going to be done through different hills that are at least on similar elevation or could actually be overlooking some of these defenses and some of these villages. At the same time, the Russian forces are continuing to, to, continuing to push from the northeastern direction, but also from the northwest towards Jelana. The Russians, as you can see, have pushed through several tree lines. They're just sending in these DRG units first. This has been the case now for about three days. And during that three-day period, we haven't had as many updates about the advances here, which is to be expected because we're talking about now fighting shifting away from generally open fields that are west of Volvce and towards specific organized settlements. So there always is going to be a bit of uh, ambiguity when the Russians first reach those regions and there's a back and forth because there is still a strong Ukrainian garrison despite the fact they've been pushed back continuously this past month. And so now we're getting the confirmation that the Russians are just advancing from every vector possible, also utilizing a motorcycle. So they're using these bikes to very quickly and with a lot of mobility reach the front line, conduct scouting operations, maybe even dismount and conduct permanent assault operations. But then that gives the Russians the proper reconnaissance and preparation to actually begin the head-on assaults. And that's what we're beginning to see now. The Russians advancing along the rail line, 800 meters, 900, and then along this tree line, about 500 meters, and so this northern flank is really exposed now, and the Russians do definitely have the elevation superiority. You could say the same thing about Sorhivka. The Russians very close to it and are overlooking the hamlets through their positions on the rail embankment. You could also see how they advanced through this particular uh, tree line, basically reaching this vertical um, sort of bush area just to the west. And in terms of the gain itself, the Russians, just as past 24 hours, were able to advance 200 meters. And so there's also going to be a head-on assault towards the Sarhivka region. Looking at Vesele, this is really important because following Vesele, there's nothing in between that and Hordivka, as we said before. And so you have to wonder which units are really defending here. To my knowledge, you do have elements of the 47th Mechanized Brigade that were sent in to fill the holes over here, which is completely understandable because out of all the frontline villages, you could say that Jelana is really important for the Ukrainians to maintain control over. But just as much or even, even more, uh, Vesele also has to be protected, not only for Hordivka, but also more generally for Ivanivka and for all of this southern flank of the Torets River Valley, which is now under a lot of threats, not just directly, but also from that southern flank, which begins with Vesele. And so you have to keep an eye out for the developments here because the Russian forces are already rather deep into the hamlets. 
and they may actually be able to take it over in the next few days. And so here we have this geolocation. It is from August 1st and it's from the Strike drone company, one of the best Ukrainian drone units all around and specifically in the 47th Brigade. And so they spotted 13 Russian soldiers. And so that is a pretty significant amount in the same house together because that's where they were found by the reconnaissance drones. And then they were targeted by FTVs within the house. They went into a basement, also targeted. At that point, they had to leave following the high payload explosion and basically dispersed into nearby regions. At least two of them were uh, struck directly as they were trying to hide within some of these forested plantations over here. And others were also injured during the strikes. And so that should give you an idea of how the Ukrainians are just trying to spot individual groups that are advancing and just sort of pluck them off one by one. That's a lot of the defensive activity that we're seeing right now. We're not seeing that many Bradleys or Abrams involved in direct confrontations with the Russian side. There are also artillery operations by the Ukrainians. They are expending a lot of the shells they do have available at their disposal towards trying to stop large accumulations of Russian soldiers because that has recently become a big problem with the Russians feeling more galvanized and more safe as they advance through the windbreaks of the rail line. And so the Ukrainians are trying to take away that sort of sense of uh, confidence by targeting those regions and also the houses with FPVs and artillery on a, a rather constant basis. But for the time being, the Russians are continuing with this operation of advancing specifically through the tree lines and not through the open fields, not relying as much on armored vehicles for the spearhead. The spearhead right now is, is actually coming from individual infantry that are just sort of preparing the groundwork for then the eventual Russian vehicular assault that will come later and fully sort of solidify Russian control over particular regions. And so just north of Vesele, we have here uh, the Russian forces advancing about 900 meters north, getting control nearly of the road that we say comes from Hordivka and actually connects to the rail line. And at this point, it's not really being used by the Ukrainians at the front line, but it could start being used by the Russians because they have used it a lot throughout their operations to take over Prokhraz and villages east of the Vavta River from Acheritina, and now it could just continue being used along the heights by Russian uh, armored assets. They do have a lot of tank regiments in this region that could be thrown further north from Umanske or uh, Orlivka, for instance, Avdivka, whatever it may be, it's here. And that could also compromise the situation in Ivanivka because now you have Russian forces that are knocking on the southern flank of the village. And in terms of a lot of the retreats for the Ukrainians, they're coming from Prokhraz to Ivanivka. And so, again, displacing them once again would be a big issue for uh, Ukraine's uh, sort of continued attrition rates and, of course, their fatigue more generally. And so you can see the Russians also pushing, let's see by how much, nearly 650 meters westwards. And so the Russians are also approaching from the southeastern direction here. So keep an eye out for a coordinated Russian assault on this really important frontline village. At the same time, while we're talking about villages in this region, and I will have a very in-depth analysis towards all of the topography and dynamics towards Pokrovsk in the future. But for now, look at Timofivka. This is a village that the Russians only recently entered. We can see the polygon from a previous video. It may have been actually just earlier this week when the Russians infiltrated to here, and it was agreed nearly universally by both sides. Now, Ukrainian sources are mentioning the capture of Timofivka by the Russians. It shouldn't really come as a surprise because it is such a small hamlet, not many houses here. So once the Russians do make a, a sort of presence known here, it's going to be very difficult for anyone else to displace them. And so now the Russians, it is important that they do have this sort of foothold within the Torets River line, which is an important line, first of all, because it gives the Russians access to taking over this hill south of Vozhvizhenka. And then having that sort of pressure on Vozhvizhenka could be just enough to help the Russians get full control over this sort of general theater that is south of the Pokrovsk Highway, which is all located on a hill in these two parallel lines that I'm marking. And that would be just enough for the Russians to make it hard for the Ukrainians to advance logistically through that area, but also to physically begin assaults towards that region. At the same time, another issue is that it helps the Russians flank the Sishnya and continue advancing along the river valley towards other small hamlets that the Ukrainians are trying to turn into temporary deployment points for defense. And what it all leads to, 
once you go further west along this river line is that it gives the Russians a very strong uh, sort of salient or flank that is only about, if we're going to measure it, let's see, eight kilometers away from Mirnohrad. At that point, it's going to be subject to daily barrages, constant barrages every single day from higher elevated positions located eastwards, located in between Simofivka and Vozhvizhenka, located near rail embankments. And it's going to be very difficult for Ukraine to mount a large-scale defense in Mirnohrad under that constant shelling. Of course, they can do it. We've seen them do it in various other urban areas. But I do believe the Ukrainians expected that their various layers of defenses here, whether it be in the Vapcha River or even eastwards from that in various temporary lines to protect the post avdivka line, or whether it be with defensive fortifications that are now being built and passed through west of the river, a lot of that is happening at a pace that the Ukrainians would have hoped uh, would not manifest this quickly. And you could see that with the fact that a lot of these defenses are not completely finished. I will update the trench map in a couple of videos in the future. And then you'll see the full extent of the defenses because there are more than you see on the map in yellow. And that will give you an illuminated view of the situation. But again, they really did want to use the Vavcha River line to protract the uh, Russian advance to buy enough time to just really turn all these cities like Mirnohrad and Pokrovsk into fortresses. And obviously, they still will be very difficult to take over, as is any urban area. But again, the extent will be uh, less than if you had an additional months to prepare. And so just once again, the Russians advanced. And with Intimofivka took it over. It's a gain of about 800 meters in the western direction. Now, moving on to the New York axis, we do have two places to look at. First of all, the Russians are making a serious attempt at getting control of the hill that is located east of Pantelia Monivka. Maybe they also want to go for the village itself, but the immediate goal is to secure control over all these tree lines located in this X just southwest of Eurifka in order to provide a, a more cohesive and wide flank for the Russian salient that has been created along the rail line going to the heart of New York. And also by doing this, the Russians will be able to overlook Alexander Peel and these various other villages located in this vertical line heading towards Sukhabalka. That is very important for the sort of temporary defense line built up by the Ukrainians north of Cheratina, connecting Kalinove to Sukhabalka. A lot of that could be undermined by taking over a height that overlooks it from the east. So that's just one aspect with the Russian forces advancing here in total if we're looking at it uh, maybe 700 meters westwards. Then looking at New York, it is important to note that over the past two weeks, the Ukrainians have been able to stabilize the situation here. That uh, credit is due to the Ukrainian defenders that came in hastily from many parts of the front line, some of them not in their entirety. So some of them were detached from their brigade headquarters and moved in alone. And that makes it way harder to move to a new front and coordinate alone. And so if we're looking at the defense here, it consists of the 41st Mechanized Brigade, Scala Battalion, really important assault units. Territorial Defense Brigade may be operating around here. And you also have 53rd Mechanized Brigade moved away from the Vavcha River area. In terms of the Ukrainian counterattack that occurred, we have a video from August 1st. So it was released by Ukrainian channels from the Scala Battalion, where they were actually able to dismount within an area that was previously under Russian control. You could see that the light blue color signifies the Ukrainian advance in its entirety amounting to about 500, 600 meters southwards. They utilized a Kozak armored personnel carrier. And once they dismounted the squads, and I believe that it was over 12 Ukrainian soldiers that were dismounted, they landed in this region just north of the Torets River, which may have been a reason why they could have uh, successfully took it back because it is a bit of a bridge too far for the Russians because it is just past the Torets River and most of the Russian possessions are located south of said river. And so the Ukrainians took advantage of the Russians being perhaps overextended in this region and were able to counterattack, comb through these houses that you see in this sort of blue color. It's an area that it's 22 hectares and they took over houses. They were able to capture at least three Russian soldiers as POWs and engaged in heavy firefights with Russian soldiers from house to house eventually pushing them back across the river into other houses that are located further south. At the same time as Scala was doing this, and Scala is known for these sort of operations, they are very specialized and rather small units. 
that does have some of the more uh, Western adjacent weaponry and training. And so they're involved in some of these very dangerous frontline operations that have to be conducted quickly and with drone support. So just westwards, the Russian forces were actually able to advance per Ukrainian sources. 27 hectares in terms of the advance. Uh, let's look at how, by how much they were able to advance because they took over this garage area. And also a lot of the uh, remaining sort of northwestern portions of this district of New York. I forgot the actual name. I think it's called Petrovska Gora, this sort of southwestern section of New York. And now most of it is either a gray zone or under the control of the Russians. They were able to just pass over the Torrets River over here and begin the first forays into the northern bank of New York into some really important houses, various facilities near the cultural center. And the Russians are really trying to shape the battlefield in a way where they would be able to begin assaults towards this really massive industrial facility, which serves as the nexus for New York and really determines who ends up controlling it in its entirety. And so just keep an eye out for uh, Russians, first of all, solidifying control of the southern bank and then finding ways to cross over in a more uh, organized and larger scale manner towards the northern bank. Now, just for a second, I don't want to look at frontline updates from the Toretsk axis because we don't have anything uh, new in terms of changes. But we do have this video from the Bulava drone unit showing that it hits a Russian T, not 70, but it was a Russian T-80 actually that was advancing along a path that you've seen marked with the uh, blue icon towards the suburb of Pivnishnya. And this has become a really common route for Russian vehicles. And a lot of them are starting to get targeted by Ukrainian drone units. Bulava drone unit previously operated around the Velika Novosilka axis. And what this confirms to us is that the third mechanized battalion of the separate presidential brigade has not been moved to defend in this region. And this was a uh, battalion that was previously imagined, as I said, to be in the, the southern Donetsk front. It's now been redirected and is now completely on its own, detached from the rest of the brigade structure. And this is a common theme with this unit. Basically, every single battalion is split off and sent to a different part of the front line. And now this one's been recently moved to here. And then the other uh, uh, unit that I saw recently, based on footage from urban combat in Pivnishnya, is the 8th Special uh, Purpose Regiment. And so this is, again, from the SSO forces for the Ukrainians. It was probably previously operating around Chasivyar and was just recently moved in to help with just slowing down and degrading the Russian forces as they push through these eastern suburbs of Toretsk. But as you can see, the Russians recently did make a lot of important advances through Zaliznya, extending northwards into Bivnishnya. And you could see that in my video from yesterday. And so, yeah, that's all I have for today. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.